Hey, good afternoon everyone. Tractor Man 44 here. Today, this is truly going to be a sheet metal hack. Uh, what you're going to do is not uh, recommended or considered to be done on a job site, uh, usually anyway. Uh, it's a situation to where if you've got to do it to get by, you can do it, but you have to promise to come back and do it better later. Uh, it's, a, it's a thing that you can utilize whenever you're working for yourself in your own system though, which is why I'm doing it here. Number one, I was working on the flute pipe on my furnace and found out that I had a bad concentric reducer from 7 to 8 inch. So I'm going to make an 8 inch plug and tap it with a 7 inch 90. Again, not necessarily recommended, but in this particular case, kind of pressed for time and I can make a promise to come back and do it better when I've got more time and do a proper video. This is definitely a sheet metal hack. So the first thing we got to do is we have to make a collar that goes 8 inch. So you got to figure out what, uh, what the circumference of 8 inch is. Uh, circumference equals pi times diameter. So if you've got 3.14 times 8, and you know it's going to be about 25 inches, so 3.14 times 8 is going to be 24, 20, 25.12. 25.12 inches, that's 25 and 1 8 inches essentially in length. Then you have to allow for a bend to go on each end to one go this direction and one to go the opposite direction so that you can bend those tabs into 180, bend them over and lock them down like this and create that collar. And what I'm using here is a 24 gauge roofing material. It's actually a steel. It's a very good steel. And some of the scrap of what I got left over from putting on a standing seam, a standing seam on my own house. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this strip out here. That stuff is some tough material to cut. Obviously I have a copper colored, copper tone colored roof. So now we want to bend approximately a half of an inch over. So before we, before we do that, we'll go ahead and and lay out the length that we want to, uh, to end up with. I'm going to go ahead and mark off a half inch. It's going to grow a little bit so I'm going to make it a sixteenth shorter. I'm going to go twenty-five and a sixteenth and then I'm going to add a half inch to that. Now I'm going to mark the back side of the one. I'm going to bend this 180 degrees this way, and then the other one, I'm going to bend 180 degrees the other way. Now normally if there's any kind of a bends in this whatever, you have to go to the roller, and we would go ahead and roll this in a circle. But because this is not that critical, and it's only single thickness, I'm going to just very gently kind of shape it around. And lash the two halves together. Now comes the fun. Now if this turns out just a little bit too big, all you have to do is crimp it a little more severely with the crimping tool and to get it to fit down inside that. But this should come very, very close to 8 inches whenever we're done. Now, you know, when people talk about anvils, everybody always pictures a blacksmith anvil. Uh, nobody ever thinks about a tenor or a tenor's anvil. But if you take a look here, this is a, this is a square chunk right here. It's a pretty, pretty solid, pretty heavy piece of metal. For about 12 inches, it's square, square shaped, and you got a nice big flat work table. But the remaining 24 or 26 inches, you've got a half moon round. And that is for shaping round pipe. Old timers years, years ago made their own flute pipes, made their own round pipes, made their own adapters and all that kind of stuff. And they used the Adams Manufacturing Company anvil like this in order to make those fittings. So whenever you've got your anvil set on the bench, you have to think about that joint that we're making here and how we're going to use that joint. We're going to place that joint right on top of the anvil, but we've got to figure out how to latch that down. Then you take a look at these here. If you look, you'll see these have uh, like a quarter inch groove in it. This is real shiny. I use that a lot. This is a three-eighths groove. There's another three-eighths groove, a little more shiny. And then here's a half-inch groove right here. That's for the different dimension of those tabs that you fold over in order to lock down. So right now, I started with a half an inch. So we're going to check and see if the half inch will work or if I can get by with the three-eighths. Half inch is still perfect on it, so I'm going to go ahead and use the half inch. 
Now this being steel is a little bit different. It works a little bit different than what galvanized metal does. The galvanized metal is a little bit softer and uh, you have a tendency to be able to get it to work with tools like this a little bit easier. So you got to make sure that that is all the way up to the hilt inside there. Set it right on top. Give it a little bit of a set, not crazy. But now, if you look, on the inside, see it's perfectly flush. And on the outside, it's very nice. Now you've got a couple of options. You can drill and put a couple of steel rivets in there, or you can do like the old timers. If you notice, I've always got steel scratch alls around, but uh, the old timers would use these right here. And they would set that something on that order. So that should be fairly close to an 8 inch diameter. Again, this is a hack. This is not accepted on the job site. It's just a way to get you by in an emergency. Well, we know we need about an eight inch cap, so we're gonna start off with a with making this an eight inch, eight inch circle here. I wanna to add to that approximately three quarters of an inch. We're gonna go ahead and cut this out. Now bear in mind, this is 24 gauge steel. This is not 24 gauge galvanized. Entirely different material. very difficult using scraps or old material sometimes. Combined with the thickness of this stuff here. There's our plug right there. Get your 30 degree V notchers. I don't know if you noticed, but I got an equal number of notches per quadrant by putting those four op opposing 90 degree apart. You just keep dividing the amount of space in half and you can pretty much make it come out the way you need it to come out. If you'd have just started here and went around, you'd have ended up with some of them very, very close. You know, little bitty ones, you'd have some of them much, much larger. So that way right there, it just kind of makes it, uh, makes it a little bit better for you. Now we have to securely attach this right here and then we'll set these all in a little bit better than what they are. Now if you're doing this in the application which I'm using it uh, for a wood furnace, do not use aluminum pop rivets. Uh, first off, I wouldn't recommend doing this at all because like I said, this is entirely a hack. Uh, it's just something to get me by because it's going to be minus 3 degrees Fahrenheit within the next two days and it's going to be a sustained, a sustained cold snap. Uh, so at any rate, do not use aluminum pop rivets on there because of your obvious flue temperatures. Uh, flue temperatures on these things can get close to 12, 1400 degrees and aluminum is not going to withstand. So try to always use steel if you're going to pop rivet it. If not, you have to make sure that you put in self-tapping uh, screws, uh, like I said, and to promise that this is entirely temporary. Again, steel pop rivet. Unfortunately, these are very long. There's a method to the madness in the dimension that I'm making this because I'm going into a steel collar. I made this short so that by the time I put the crimps on it, hopefully it's going to recess in to where just the tips of these will be held in place by the steel collar that's actually going through the concrete. It may or may not work exactly like that, but that's what the plan was. Well, you can see we got a good number of steel rivets all the way around the perimeter. So now you see another, another function.
They're bratted over on the inside. Nice and secure. They should not interfere with the 7 inch cap. Now if you don't think this will cut the fire out of the palm of your hand or the inside of your fingers, just forget what you're doing for a second let it slide right through there. You'll find out in a hurry. Remember, I want the tails of these tabs to go inside the, the steel casing in the concrete wall. That should be adequate. You obviously see all the rivets. You can see the joint. And hopefully this is going to fit a 7 inch diameter round pipe fairly snugly. I want, it to I want it to be very snug. Here it is. Very nice and snug just the way I wanted it. Now when I get this installed in the steel casing, then I'll go about the business of clipping this together. Now, bear in mind, you don't use adjustable 90s on flue pipes normally. But, what I've done, I've done this for 40 years. I will take and I'll screw me a, a hanging strap right across each one of these joints and screw all of these together and bind them together. Put one on this side, and I'll put one on the other side, and even a strap right down the center of the back side. That way, in the event there's ever a flue fire or an extreme deterioration of this uh, 90, while the furnace is in operation, it's not going to fall apart. Okay, now I stressed all along, you know, that this is not a how-to video. It's not even an accepted thing to do on a job site, uh, but it is something that can get you by. Again, I'm not suggesting that you do it by any stretch of the imagination at all, but it's good heavy gauge. This is a 24 gauge steel. This is 24 gauge adjustable 90 it's going to be just fine for my situation. Don't have to bother telling me about the noxious gas that's going to be given off whenever this gets exceptionally hot. It'll actually discolor in the, as the galvanizing is slowly, slowly moved off. But uh, it's nothing to be concerned about in my particular case. Your case, I wouldn't do it at all. Would never do it for a customer. But I'm my own customer in this particular case. If you're concerned too about the tiny bit of opening you know, like cracks and crevices that people may think is going to let smoke escape and everything. One thing that you that a lot of people don't realize, but most people think that, you know, there's flue pressure. There's pressure inside the flue, and it's going to, if you've got a hole in your pipe, like a screw hole or a joint or something like that, that it's going to exhaust some smoke into your house. In actuality, your flue is going to be on a negative pressure. In other words, it's drawing up the chimney. You've heard of that phrase before. Make sure your chimney's drawing before you build a fire, or if you build a fire, you have to make sure you get hot quick in order for it to draw up the chimney. That's because the cold column of air that's in that chimney is wanting to fall downward into the lighter, warmer air inside your house. So you have to flash that flue temperature with some paper or whatever to elevate that temperature and get it drawing upward. So, if it's drawing upward and you have a hole or a crack in your joint or in your pipe, is that negative pressure going to let smoke escape? No. It's going to draw air into that opening and right up the chimney, cooling down the flue gases as it's going. So, got a whole long discussion about that. Shouldn't even have gone there right now, but I did. It was an accident. And you know what? Uh, I'm going to go install this. This is Tractor Man 44, and I am out of here, guys.